52 Weeks for Florette, an O. Henry Memorial Award Prize Story of 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wendy Almeida. 52 Weeks for Florette by Elizabeth Alexander Hearman. It had been over two months since Freddie Le Fay's bill had been paid, and Miss Nellie Blair was worried. She had written to Freddie's mother repeatedly, but there had been no answer. "'It's all your own fault, sister. You should never have taken Freddie,' Miss Eva said sharply. "'I told you so at the time, when I saw his mother's hair. And, of course, Le Fay is not her real name. It looks to me like a clear case of desertion.' "'I can't believe it. She seemed so devoted,' faltered Miss Nellie. "'Oh, a girl like that?' Miss Eva sniffed. "'You should never have consented.' "'Well, the poor thing was so worried, and if it meant saving a child from a dreadful life, there are other schools more suitable.' But, sister, she seemed to have her heart set on ours. She begged me to make a little gentleman out of him. As if you could ever do that. Why not? asked Mary, their niece. That dreadful child. Freddy isn't dreadful, cried Mary hotly. With that atrocious slang, won't eat his oatmeal, and he's such a queer child. Queer, so pale, never laughs, doesn't like anyone. Why should you take up for him? He doesn't even like you. Hates me, I suppose. It's because we are so different from the women he has known, said Mary. I should hope so. Well, sister, what are you going to do about it? I don't know what to do, sighed Miss Nellie. He hasn't any other relatives, as far as I know. And the summer coming on, what shall we do? Nothing for it but to send him to an orphanage if she doesn't write soon, said Miss Eva. Oh, Auntie, you wouldn't. Why not? How can we afford to give children free board and education? It's only one child. It would be a dozen if we once started it. I'll wait another month, said Miss Nellie. And then, really, something will have to be done. The girl looked out of the window. There he is now, she said, sitting on the stone wall at the end of the garden. It's his favorite spot. What on earth he wants to sit there for, away from all the other children? He never plays. Look at him, just sitting there, not moving. How stupid, exclaimed Miss Eva impatiently. I, I do declare I believe he's fallen asleep, said Miss Nellie. Freddy was not asleep. He had only to close his eyes and it would all come back to him. Memories that he could not put into words, sensations without definite thought crowded in upon him. The smell, the thick smell of grease paint, choking powder, dust, gas, old walls, bodies and breath and sharp perfume. The sickening, delicious, stale, enchanting, never-to-be-forgotten odor of the theater. The nerves' sudden tension at the cry of, Overture! their tingling as the jaded music blares, the lift of the heart as the curtain rises, the catch in the throat as Florette runs on to do her turn. Florette was a performer on the trapeze in vaudeville. Her figure was perfect from the strenuous daily exercise. She was small, young, and a shade too blonde. First she appeared in a sort of blue evening dress, except that it was shorter even than a debutante's. She ran out quickly from the wings, bowed excessively, smiled appealingly, and, skipping over to the trapeze, seized the two iron rings that hung from ropes. Lifting her own weight by the strength in her slender wrists, she flung her legs upward and hooked her knees into the rings. Then, hanging head downward, she swung back and forth, flung herself upright again, sat and swung, climbed to the topmost bar of the trapeze, and hung down again. Her partner ran on and repeated her monkey-like maneuvers. 
Then Florette held his hands while he swung upside down. He held Florette while she swung upside down. They turned head over heels, over and over each other, up and down, catching and slipping and adjusting their balance in time to gay tunes. Sometimes the audience clapped. Sometimes they were too familiar with their kind of flirtation with death to clap. Then Florette and her partner would invent something a little more daring. They would learn to balance themselves on chairs tilted on two legs on the trapeze. Or Florette would hang by only one hand. Or she would support her partner by a strap held in her teeth. Sometimes Florette's risks were great enough to thrill the audience with the thought of death. The thought of a slip, broken bones, delighted the safe people in comfortable chairs. They laughed. Florette laughed, too, for Freddy was waiting in the wings. There were mothers in the audience who cooked and mended, swept and dusted, ran up and down innumerable stairs, washed greasy dishes, wore ugly house dresses, slaved and scolded and got chapped hands, all for their children. Florette, always dainty and pretty, had nothing to do but airily, gracefully swing and smile. Other mothers spent their lives for their little boys. Florette only risked hers twice a day. While the partner played an accordion, Florette ran out for her quick change. Freddie was waiting with her dress hung over a chair. He flew to meet her. His eager, nimble fingers unfastened the blue frock. He slipped the next costume over her head without mussing a single beloved blonde hair. The second costume was a tight-fitting silver bodice with a fluff of green skirt underneath. Freddie had it fastened up in a twinkling. Florette ran out again and pulled herself up into the trapeze. While Florette went through the second part of her act, Freddie folded up the blue costume and trudged upstairs with it. Florette's dressing room was usually up four flights. Freddie put the blue dress on a coat hanger and wrapped a muslin cover about it. Then he trudged down the four flights again with the third costume over his arm. It was a Chinese jacket and a pair of tight, short blue satin trousers, and Freddie was very proud of this confection. He stood as a screen for Florette while she put on the trousers, and there are not many little boys who have a mama who could look so pretty in them. Florette skipped out lightly and finished her act by swinging far out over the audience, back and forth, faster and faster, farther and farther out, until it seemed as if she were going to fling herself into the lap of some middle-aged gentleman in the third row. His wife invariably murmured something about a hussy as Florette's pretty bare legs flashed overhead. The music played louder, ended with a boom from the drum. Florette flung herself upright, kissed her hands, the curtain fell, and the bare-legged hussy ran up to the dressing room where her little son waited. Freddy had already hung up and shrouded the silver and green costume and was waiting for the Chinese one. He pounced upon it, muttered about some wrinkles, put it into place, and went to the dressing table to hand Florette the cold cream. He found her makeup towel all caked with red and blue, which she had flung down on the floor. He patted her highly glittering hair and adjusted a pin. He marshaled the jars and little pans and sticks of grease paint on her shelf into an orderly row and blew off the deep layers of powder she had scattered. Then he took down her street dress from its hook and slipped it deftly over her shoulders and had it buttoned up before Florette could yawn. He handed her her saucy bright hat. He flung himself into his own coat. Well, let's go, Florette, cried Freddy gaily with dancing eyes. He had never called her Mama. She was too little and cute. Then they would go to the hotel, never the best, where they were stopping. The room with its greenish light, its soiled lace curtains, the water pitcher always cracked, the bed always lumpy, the sheets always damp, was home to Freddy. Florette made it warm and cozy, even when there was no heat in the radiator. She had all sorts of clever homemaking tricks. She toasted marshmallows over the gas jet. She spread a shawl on the trunk. Or she surprised Freddy by pinning pictures out of the funny page on the wall. She could make the nicest tea on a little alcohol stove she carried in her trunk. 
there was always a little feast after the theater on the table that invariably wobbled. Freddy would pretend that the foot of the iron bed was a trapeze. How they laughed. On freezing nights in Maine or Minnesota, Florette would let Freddy warm his feet against hers, or she would get up and spread her coat that looked just like fur over the bed. When they struck a new town at the beginning of each week, Freddy and Florette would go bumming and see all the sights, whether it was Niagara Falls or just the new Methodist church in Cedar Rapids. Freddy would have been sorry for little boys who had to stay in one home all the time, that is, if he had known anything at all about them. But the life of the strolling player was all that he had ever known, and he found it delightful, except for the dreaded intervals of book and the act. The dream of every vaudevillian is to be booked for 52 unbroken weeks in the year, but few attain such popularity. Florette's seasons were sometimes long, sometimes short, but there always came the tedious, worrying intervals when managers and agents must be besought for work. Perhaps she would find that people were tired of her old tricks, and she would have to rehearse new ones, or interpolate new songs and gags. Then the new act would be tried out at some obscure vaudeville house, and if it didn't go, the rehearsals and trampings to agents must begin all over again. Freddy shared the anxieties and hardships of these times, but the only hardship he really minded was the loss of Florette. For, of course, the pretty Miss Le Fay, who was only 19 on the agent's books, could not appear on Broadway with a great big boy like Freddy. However, the bad times always ended, and Florette and Freddy would set out gaily once more for Oshkosh or Atlanta, Dallas or Des Moines. Meals expanded, Florette bought a rhinestone-covered comb, and the two adventurers indulged in an orgy of chocolate drops. With the optimism of the actor, they forgot all about the dismal past weeks and saw the new tour as never-ending. Freddy felt himself once more a real and important human being with a place in the sun, not just a child to be shushed by a dingy landlady while his mother was out looking for a job. He knew that he was as necessary a part of Florette's act as her makeup box. He believed himself to be as necessary a part of her life as the heart in her breast, for Florette lavished all her beauty, all her sweetness on him. No Johns for Florette, pretty and blonde though she was. To the contempt of her contemporaries, Florette refused every chance for a free meal. Freddy was her sweetheart, her man. She had showered so many pretty love words on him, she had assured him so often that he was all in the world she wanted, that Freddy was stunned one day to hear that he was to have a papa. I don't want one said Freddy flatly. I ain't never had one, and I ain't got no use for one. Florette looked cross. An unusual thing. Oh, now, Freddy, don't be a grouch, she said. I don't want one, repeated Freddy. You ought to be glad to get a papa, cried Florette. Why? Makes you respectable, was that. Who'd believe I was a widow in this profession? Freddy still looked blank. Well, said Florette, you're going to get a nice papa, so there now. Then the cruel truth dawned on Freddy. It was Florette who wanted a papa. He had not been enough for her. In some way, Florette had found him lacking. Tactfully, Freddy dropped the subject of papas, wooed Florette, and tried to atone for his shortcomings. He redoubled his compliments, trotted out all the love words he knew, coaxed Florette with everything she liked best in him. He even offered to have his nails filed. At night, in bed, he kissed Florette's bare back between the shoulder blades and snuggled close to her, hugging her desperately with his little thin arms. Flo, he quavered, you, you ain't lonesome no more, are you? Me? Lonesome? What you talking about, kid? sleepily murmured Florette. 
You ain't never lonesome when you got me around, are you, Flo? Sure I ain't. Go to sleep, honey. But Florette, Florette was dozing. Oh, Florette, 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 if you ain't lonesome, shh, shh, let's go to sleep. But Florette, you don't want, you don't want a, a pup. Shh, I'm so tired, honey. Florette slept. Freddy lay awake, but he lay still so as not to disturb her. His arms ached, but he dared not let her go. Finally, he slept and dreamed of a world in which there was no Florette. He shuddered and kicked his mother. She gave him a little impatient shove. He woke. Day was dawning. It was Florette's wedding day. Freddy did not know it until Florette put on her best coral velvet hat with the jet things dangling over her ears. You ain't gonna wear that hat, said Freddy severely. It's raining. Yeah, I'm gonna wear this hat, said Florette, pulling her blonde ear bobs into greater prominence. And you put on your best suit and new necktie. We're going to a wedding. Her tone was gay, arch. Her eyes were happy. Who? Whose? Freddie faltered. Mine, chirped Florette. I'm going to get you that papa I promised you. Freddie turned away. Sulkin, chided Florette. Naughty, jealous boy. The new papa did not appear so formidable as Freddie had expected. In fact, he turned out to be only Howard, Florette's acrobatic partner. Freddie philosophically reflected that if one must have a new papa, far better so to call Howard, who necessarily encroached on Florette's time, than a stranger who might take up some of her leisure hours. But Freddie received a distinct shock when the new papa joined them after the evening performance and accompanied them up to their room. Freddie had always regarded Florette's room as his, too. He felt that the new papa was an intruder in their home. Alas, it soon became all too apparent that it was Freddie who was de trop, or, as he would have expressed it, a Mr. Batinsky. They were having a little supper of pickles and cheese and liver sausage and jam. Florette and the papa drank out of a bottle by turns and laughed a great deal. Florette seemed to think the papa very clever and funny. She laughed at everything he said. She looked at him with shining eyes. She squeezed his hand under the table. Freddy tried in vain to attract her attention. Finally, he gave up and sat staring at the oblivious couple with a stupid expression. The kid's half asleep, said the new papa. Florette looked at Freddy and was annoyed by his vacant eyes. Go to bed right away, she commanded. Freddy looked at her in amazement. Ain't you going to, Florette? he asked. No, you go on, go to sleep. Get into that nice little cot and go bye-bye, said the new papa genially. Freddy had not seen the cot before. It had been moved in during his absence at the theater and stood white, narrow, and lonely, partly concealed by a screen. I, I always slept with Florette, faltered Freddy. This seemed to amuse the new papa, but Florette flushed and looked annoyed. Now, Freddy, are you going to be a grouch? She wailed. Freddy was kissed good night and went to sleep in the cot. He found it cold and unfriendly. But habit, the much maligned, is kind as well as cruel. If it can accustom us to evil, so can it soften pain. Freddy was beginning to assume proprietary airs toward the cot, which appeared in every town, and even to express views as to the relative values of cots in Springfield, Akron, or Joliet, when one night he woke to hear Florette sobbing. Freddy lay awake listening. He had sobbed, too, when he was first banished to the cot. Was Florette missing him as he had missed her? Ah, if she at last had seen that Papa's were not half so nice as Freddy's, he would not be hard on her. His heart swelled with forgiveness and love. 
he stole on tiptoe to Florette's bedside. Flo, he whispered. The sobbing ceased. Florette held her breath and pretended to be asleep. Freddy wriggled his little thin body under the covers and threw his arms around Florette. With a gulp, she turned and threw her arms around him. They clasped each other tight and clung without speaking. They lay on the edge of the bed, holding their breath, in order not to wake the papa, who snored loudly. Freddy's cheeks and hair were wet. A cold tear trickled down his neck. His body ached from the hard edge of the bed. But he was happy, as only a child or a lover can be. And Freddy was both. In the morning, the papa was cross. He did not seem to care for his own breakfast, but concentrated his attention on Freddy's. Freddy had always been accustomed to a nice breakfast of tea and toast and jam, but Howard insisted on ordering oatmeal for him. No, nah, Freddy can't stand oatmeal, Florette objected. It's good for him, said Howard, staring severely at his son across the white-topped restaurant table. I don't see no use forcing a person to eat what they can't stomach, said Florette. Yeah, that's the way you always spoil that kid. Look at them pale cheeks, little old pale face, Howard taunted, stretching a teasing hand toward Freddy. Mama's boy, regular sissy he is. He gave Freddy a poke in the ribs. Freddy shrank back, made himself as small as possible in his chair, looked mutely at Florette. Oh, cut it out, Howard, she begged. Quit ragging the kid, can't you? Mama's blessed sugar lump jeered Howard with an ugly gleam in his eye. Ought to wear a bib with pink ribbons, so he ought. Give me a nursing bottle for the baby waiter. The impertinence of this person amazed Freddy. He could only look at his tormentor speechlessly. Freddy and Florette had been such great chums that she had never used the maternal prerogative of rudeness. He had never had any home life, so he was unaware of the coolness with which members of a family can insult one another. Howard's tones, never low, were unusually loud this morning, and people turned around to laugh at the blushing child. The greasy waiter grinned and set the oatmeal which Howard had ordered before Freddy. Now then, young man, commanded Howard sternly, you eat that and you eat it quick. Freddy obeyed literally, swallowing as fast as he could, with painful gasps and gulps fighting to keep the tears back. Florette reached under the table and silently squeezed his knee. He flashed her a smile and swallowed a huge, slimy mouthful. You ain't eaten nothing yourself, Howard, said Florette acidly. Why don't you have some oatmeal? That's right shouted Howard. Side with the kid against me. That's all the thanks I get for trying to make a man out of old sissy. Ought to known better than to marry a woman with a spoiled brat. Shh, whispered Florette. Don't tell the whole restaurant about your family troubles. Say, hissed Howard, bending down toward her and thrusting out his jaw. Lay off of me, will you? Lay off yourself retorted Florette under her breath. If you want to fight, let's go back to the hotel where it's private. I don't mind telling the world I've been stung, roared Howard. Florette flushed up to the slightly darker roots of her too blonde hair. You? she gasped furiously. After all I've put up with? Say, you ain't got any kick coming. I treated you white marrying you and no questions asked. What do you mean? breathed Florette, growing deathly pale. Freddy, alarmed, half rose from his chair. Sit down there, you, roared Howard. What do I mean, Miss Innocence? he said, mimicking Florette's tone. Oh, no, of course you ain't no idea of what I mean. Come on, Freddy, Florette broke in quickly. It's a cat's and jammer. He ain't got over last night yet. She seized Freddy's hand and walked rapidly toward the door. Howard lurched after her, followed by the interested stares of the spectators. On the street, he caught up with her, and the quarrel recommenced. The act went badly that afternoon. 
It must be hard to frolic in mid-air with a heavy heart. Under cover of the gay music, there were angry muttered words and reproaches. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! Florette would trill happily to the audience as she poised on one toe. What are you trying to do? Shake me off the bar? She would mutter under her breath to her partner. If that's right, let go of me and let me bust my bean, damn you, snarled Howard. And to the audience, he sang, Oh, ain't it great to have a little girl you can trust for life. They were still muttering angrily as they came off. The hand clapping had been faint. Oh, for God's sake, stop your jawing, half screamed Florette. It ain't no more my fault than it is yours. If they don't like us, they don't like us, that's all. She ran up the stairs, sobbing. Howard followed her. They shared a dressing room now. It was small and Freddy was in the way, although he tried to squeeze himself into the corner by the dingy stationary washstand. Howard shoved Freddy. Florette protested. The quarreling broke out afresh. Howard tipped over a bottle of liquid white. Florette screamed at him, and he raised his fist. Freddy darted out of his corner. Say, you big stiff, cut that rough stuff, see? cried little Freddy in the only language of chivalry that he knew. Howard whirled upon him furiously, calling him a name that Freddy did not understand. But Florette flung herself between them and caught the blow. He certainly looks as if he had fallen asleep, Miss Nellie Blair repeated. Better run out and get him, Mary. He might tumble off the wall. As Mary went out, a maid came in. A gentleman to see you, Miss Blair, she announced. Is it a parent? asked Miss Nellie. The maid's eyebrows twitched, and she looked faintly grieved, as all good servants do when they are forced to consider someone whom they cannot acknowledge as their superior. No, ma'am, he doesn't look like a parent, she complained. He really is a very queer-looking sort of person, ma'am. I wouldn't know exactly where to place him. Shall I say you are out, ma'am? Yes, said Miss Eva. No doubt he wants to sell us an encyclopedia. No, let him come in said Miss Nellie. It might be a reporter about Madame Davala, she added, turning to her sister. Sometimes they look queer. If it turns out to be an encyclopedia, I shall leave you at once, said Miss Eva. You are so kind-hearted that you will look through twenty-four volumes and missed your dinner. But the gentleman who came in carried no books, nor did he look like one who had ever been associated with them. Carefully dressed in the very worst of taste, from his scarf pin to his boots, he had evidently just been too carefully shaved, for there were scratches on his wide, ludicrous face, and his smile was as rueful as a clown's. The Mrs. Blair, I presume? He asked in what was unmistakably his society manner, and he held out a card. Miss Eva took it and read aloud. Mr. Bert Brannigan, Brannigan and Bowers, Blackface Comedians. Ah, uh -huh, murmured Miss Nellie, who was always polite, even in the most trying circumstances. But Miss Eva could only stare at the rich brown suit, the lavender tie, and matching socks and handkerchief. Well, said Miss Eva, Mr. Brannigan cleared his throat and looked cautiously about the room. His heavy, clown-like face was troubled. "'Where's the kid?' he asked in a hoarse whisper. "'What child?' Miss Eva snapped. Y "'You've come to see one of our pupils?' Miss Nellie faltered. "'Yeah, hers.' "'Hers? What? Miss LeFay's little boy.' "'Oh, Freddy!' Sure. Does he? He don't. You ain't told him yet, have you? Told him what? My God. Don't you know? Bert Brannigan stared at the ladies, mopping his brow with the lavender handkerchief. Please explain yourself, Mr. Brannigan, said Miss Eva. She's dead. I thought you knew. 
Miss Lafay is dead? gasped Miss Nellie. Why weren't we told? asked Miss Eva. It was in the papers, said Bert. But they didn't give Florette no front page headlines. And maybe you don't read the theatrical news. No, said Miss Eva. Well, not being in the profession, Mr. Brannigan said, as if he were apologizing for her. He sat down and continued to mop his brow mechanically. The two sisters stared in dismay at the clown who had brought bad news. What I don't know is how to tell the kid, said Bert. He was nutty about Florette. Didn't give a darn for no one else. I've been on the bill with them two lots of times, and I seen how it was. The money ain't going to be no comfort to that kid. The money? Florette's insurance made out to him. That's why I come. She want him to stay on here, see, till he was all educated. They's enough, too. She was always insured heavy for the kid. They's some back money coming to you, too, she told me. The reason why she didn't send it on was because she was out of luck and broke, see? But why didn't Miss Lafay write to us? Asked Miss Nellie. If she was in difficulties, we... No, Florette wasn't that kind. Never put up any hard luck story, understand? But she'd been out of work, sick. And when she come back... It looked like her act was a frost. I run up on her in KC and... What is KC? What, Kansas City? We was on the bill there two weeks ago. Me and Florette was all friends, see? Uh, no foolishness, if you know what I mean. I'm a married man myself. Bowers there on the cards, my wife. But me and Florette met about five years ago and kept on running on to one another on the bill, first one place and then another. Sure, was, she was glad to see me again, and me, her. Why, where's Freddy, I says, first thing. And then I, I never seen any person's face look so sad. But she begun telling me right off what a fine place the kid was at and, and how the theater wasn't no place for a child. And she says, Bert, I want him to stay where he's happy and safe, she says. Even if I never see him again, she says. Well, it give me the shivers then. Psychic, I guess. Bert paused, staring into space. And then? Miss Nellie asked gently. Well, like I was telling you, Florette had been playing in hard luck. Now, I don't know whether you ladies know anything about the vaudeville game. Some acts is booked out through the circuit from New York. Others is booked up by some little fly-by-night agent, getting a date here and a date there. Terrible chumps between stands, see? And never know in one week where you're going the next or whether at all. Well, Florette was getting her book in that way. And on that, you got to make good with each house you play. Get me? And something had went wrong with the act since I seen it last. It used to be A number one, you understand. But looked like Florette had lost interest or something. She didn't put no pep into it, if you know what I mean. And vaudeville's got to be all pep. Then, too, her and that partner of hers, John, all the time something fierce. I could hear him ragging her that afternoon and me standing in the wings and they slipped up on some of their tricks terrible and the audience laughed. But not with him. Adam, you understand? Well, so the act was a frost, and they was cancelled. Cancelled? Fired, I guess you'd call it. They was to play again that night, and then move on, see? Oh, yes. And they didn't have no book in ahead. Florette come and talk to me again, and she says again she wanted Freddie to be happy and get a better start, and she had and all. And Bert, she says, if anything ever happened to me, you go and give him the money for Freddie, she says. Poor thing. Perhaps she had a premonition of her death, murmured Miss Nellie. Bert gave her a queer look. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Perhaps so. I was watching her from the wings that night, he went on. 
the act was almost over, and I couldn't see nothing wrong. Howard had run off, and Florette was standing up on the trapeze, kissing her hands like she always done at the finish. But all of a sudden, she sort of trembled and turned halfway round like she couldn't make up her mind what to do, and lost her balance, and caught hold of a rope, and let go, and fell. Miss Nellie covered her face with her hands. Miss Eva turned away to the window. She was dead when I got to her, said Bert. Be careful, said Miss Eva sharply. The child is coming in. Freddy wasn't asleep at all, said Mary, opening the door. He was just playing a game, but he won't tell me. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know anyone was here. Freddy had stopped round-eyed, open-mouthed, with incredulous delight. Bert, he gasped, the son of a gun. Freddy, cried the Mrs. Blair. But Bert held out his arms, and Freddy ran into them. Gee, Bert, I'm glad to see you, rejoiced Freddy. Me too, kid. Glad to see you. How's the boy, huh? Getting educated, huh? Swell school, ain't it? babbled Bert, fighting for time. Oh, it's all right, I guess, Freddy replied listlessly, glancing at the Mrs. Blair, then turning again with eager interest to Bert. But say, Bert, what in the hell, I mean, what are you doing here? Well, I, uh, I just stopping by to say howdy, see, and playing in New York? No. Just come in? Yeah. Freddy drew his breath in quickly. Say, Bert, you, you ain't seen Florette anywheres? Why, yeah, yeah. Where is she, Bert? There was a deathly hush. Then Miss Eva motioned to Miss Nellie and said, If you will excuse us, Mr. Brannigan, we have some arrangements to make about the concert tonight. Madame de Valle is to sing in the school auditorium a benefit performance. And she went out, followed by her sister and niece. Where's Florette? Freddy asked again, his voice trembling with eagerness. I seen her in KC, Sonny. How's the act? Uh, fine, fine, great. No kidding? No kidding. Florette, all right? What, what made you think any different? Who hooks her up now, Bert? She hires the dresser at the theater. I could have kept on doing it, said Freddy with a sigh. Oh, now, kid, it's better for you here getting educated and all. I don't like it, Bert. Well, you don't like it? No, you don't like it. After all she done? I hate this whole school. I want to leave. You tell Florette. Oh, now, Freddy, I'm lonesome. I don't like nobody here. His voice dropped. And, and they don't like me. Oh, now, Freddy. Maybe Miss Mary does, but Miss Eva don't. Anyway, I ain't no use to anybody here. What's the use of staying where you ain't no use? And they're always calling me down. I don't do nothing right. I can't even talk so as they'll like it. Florette liked the way I talked all right. And you get what I mean, don't you, Bert? But they don't know nothing. What? They don't know nothing, Bert. What? There's one boy ain't ever been inside a theater. What do you know about that, Bert? Gee, Bert, I'm awful glad you come. I'd a bust not having somebody to talk to. Bert was silent. He still held Freddy in his arms. His heart reeled at the thought of what he must tell the child. He cleared his throat, opened his mouth to speak, but the words would not come. Freddy chattered on, loosing the floodgates of his accumulated loneliness. He told how Florette had bidden him learn to be a little gentleman, and how he really tried, but how silly were the rules that governed a gentlemanly existence. How the other little gentlemen laughed at him and talked of things he had never heard of and never heard of the things he talked of until at last he had ceased trying to be one of them. You tell Florette I gotta leave this place, he concluded firmly. Bert, now you tell Florette. Will you, Bert? Huh? Freddy, I, Freddy, listen now. I, I got something to tell you. What? I, I come on to tell you, Freddy. That's why I come out to tell you, see? Well, spit it out, Freddy laughed. Bert groaned. What's the matter, Bert? What's eating you? 
I, uh, I, say, Freddy, listen. Listen now, Freddy, I, Florette, she ain't sick. Bert, is Florette sick? No, no, I, you tell me, Bert, if it's bad news about Florette. His voice died out. His face grew white. Bert could not meet his eyes. Uh, no, no, now, Freddy. Bert mumbled, turning away his head. Y you got me all wrong. It, it's good news, Sonny. Like a flash, Freddy's face cleared. What about Bert? Good news about what? Why, uh, why the axe going big, like I told you. And, and say, boy, out at one place, out at KC, it, why, it stopped the show. Stopped the show? Breathed Freddy in awe. Oh, Bert, we never done that before. And so, so she, ah, uh, Florette. You see, kid, a count of the act going so big, why she has to go away for a little while. Go away, Bert? Where? To, to, to England and Australia. To England and Australia? Yeah, they booked her up, count of the act going so great. Oh, Bert. Yeah, a and listen, sh she's booked for 52 weeks solid. Fifty-two weeks? Oh, Bert, that ain't never happened to us before. I know. It's great. Bert blew out his breath loudly, mopped his forehead. He could look at Freddy now, and he saw a face all aglow with love and pride. When's she coming to get me, Bert? The child asked confidently. Why? Why, Freddy, now... Y Bert could only flounder and look dismayed. She ain't going off and leave me, wailed the child. Now, listen, say, wait a minute, listen. But Bert, Bert, she... Say, don't you want to help Florette? Now she's got this grand booking and all? Sure I do, Bert. I want to help her with the quick changes like I used her. You help her. Say, how would that look in all them swell places she's going to? Why, she'll have a maid. Like the headliners, Bert? Sure. A coon, Bert? Sure, like a little musical comedy star. Honest? Honest. But, Bert, why can't I go, too? Oh, now say, why, why you're too big? What do you mean, Bert? Why, kid, you talk if you've never been in the profession. How old does Miss LaFay look? Nineteen, that's all. But with a great big boy like you tagging on? Well, I say, you'd queer her with them English managers right off. You don't want to do that now, Freddy. No, but I... I knew you'd take it sensible. You've always been a lot of help to Florette. Did she tell you, Bert? Sure. All right, I'll stay. When When's she coming to tell me goodbye? What? Look here. Brace up, old man. She had to leave already. She's gone? Say, you don't think booking like that can wait, do you? It was take it or leave it, quick. You didn't want her to throw away a chance like that, huh, Freddy? Huh? Freddy's head sank on his chest. His hands fell limp. All right, he murmured without looking up. The big man bent over the child clumsily and tried to raise his quivering chin. Oh, now, Freddy, he coaxed. Want to come out with me and, and have a soda? Freddy shook his head. Buy you some candy, too. Chocolate drops? And how about one of them little airplane toys I seen in the window down the street? Huh? Or, or some marbles? Huh? Freddy, let's go buy out this here dinky little old town. What do you say, huh? Let's paint this little old town red. What do you say, sport? Freddy managed a feeble smile. How come you so flush, Brother Johnson? He asked in what he considered an imitation of darky talk. Must have been rolling them bones. That's a boy, shouted Bert with a great guffaw. There's a comeback for you. Game. That's what I always liked about you, Freddy. You was always game. I want to be game, said Freddy, stiffening his lips. You tell Florette. 
You're right to her. I was game. Will you, Bert? A bell rang. Oh, I gotta go dress for supper, Bert. They dress up for supper here. All right, kid. Then I'll be going. Goodbye, Bert. You tell her, Bert. So long, kid. Will you tell her I was game, Bert? Ah, oh, she'll know. Madame Margarita de Valle found herself in a situation all the more annoying because it was so absurd. She had promised to sing at the Mrs. Blair's school for the benefit of a popular charity, and she had motored out from New York, leaving her maid to do some errands and to follow by train. But it was eight o'clock and the great Madame de Valle found herself alone in the prim guest room of the Mrs. Blair's school, with her bag and dressing case, to be sure, but with no one to help her into the complicated draperies of her gown. There was no bell. She could not very well run down the corridor, half-nude, shouting for help, especially as she had no idea of where the Mrs. Blair kept either themselves or their servants. The Mrs. Blair had been so fatiguingly polite on her arrival. Perhaps she had been a little abrupt in refusing their many offers of service and saying that she wanted to rest quite alone. Now, of course, they were afraid to come near her. And besides, they would think that her maid was with her by this time. They had given orders to have Madame de Valle's maid shown up to her as soon as she arrived. And, of course, their maid would be too stupid to know that Madame de Valle's maid had never come. Margarita de Valle bit her lips and paced the floor, looked out of the window, opened the door, but there was no one in sight. Well, no help for it. She must try to get into the gown alone. She stepped into it and became entangled in the lace stepped out again, shook the dress angrily, and pushed it on over her head, giving a little impatient scream as she rumpled her hair. Then she reached up and back, straining her arms to push the top snap of the corsage into place. But with the quiet glee of inanimate things, the snap immediately snapped out again. Flushing, Madame de Valle repeated her performance, and the snap repeated its. Madame de Valle stamped both feet and gave a little gasp of rage. She attacked the belt with no better luck. Chiffon and lace became entangled in hooks. Snaps flew out as fast as she could push them in. Her arms ached, and the dress assumed strange, humpy outlines as she fastened it up all wrong. She would like to rip the cursed thing from her shoulders and tear it into a million pieces, she felt hysteria sweeping over her. She knew that she was going to have one of her famous fits of temper in a minute. Oh, 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 Madame de Valle screamed aloud, stamping her feet up and down as fast as they could go. Oh, 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 damn, damn, damn. She did not swear in Italian because she was not an Italian except by profession. Her name had been Maggie Davis, but that was a secret between herself and her press agent. Oh, damn, screamed Madame de Valle again. Ain't it hell, remarked an interested voice, and Madame de Valle saw a small pale face staring at her through the door which she had left ajar. Come in, she ordered, and a small, thin boy entered, quite unabashed looking at her with an air of complete understanding. "'Who are you?' asked Madame de Valle. "'Freddy?' "'Well, Freddy, run at once and find a maid for me, please. Mine hasn't come, and I'm frantic, simply frantic. Well, why don't you go?' "'I'll hook you up,' said Freddy. "'You?' "'Sure. I can do it better than any maid you get in this hell of a school.' Why, Freddy. Oh, I heard you saying damn. You're in the profession, huh? Me too. You too? His face clouded. Oh, and now you have retired? Yeah, learning to be a gemum. Let me there, said Freddy, stepping behind Madame de Valle. 
Say, you got it all started wrong. He attacked the stubborn hooks with light, deft fingers. Why, you can really do it, cried Madame Davala. Sure, this ain't nothing. Freddy's fingers flew. Careful of that drapery, it's tricky. Say, drapery's pie to me. I fastened up lots harder dresses than this. Really? Sure. Florette had swell clothes. This one's swell, too. My, ain't it great to see a classy gown again? Madame Davala laughed, and Freddy joined her. Say, you seen the teachers at this school? He asked. You seen them? Madame Davala nodded. Nice ladies, said Freddy, in an effort to be fair. But no class. You know what I mean? The way they slick their hair back and no paint or powder? Gee, Florette wouldn't wear their clothes to a dog fight. Nor I, said Madame Davala. I love dogs. I told Miss Eva she ought to put peroxide in the rinsing water for her hair, like Florette used to, but it made her mad. I believe in a woman fixing herself up all she can, don't you? asked Freddy earnestly. Indeed I do. But tell me, who is Florette? So Freddy told her all about his mother and about the good fortune that had come to her. Fifty-two weeks solid. Some act to get that kind of book and huh? he ended. Yes, oh, yes, indeed. There you are now. Look at yourself. See if it's all right. Madame Davala turned to the mirror. Her gown fell in serene, lovely folds. It seemed incredible that it was the little demon of a few minutes before. Perfect. Freddy, you're a wonder. How can I thank you? That's all right. You're welcome. He was regarding her with worshipful eyes. You're awful pretty, he breathed. Thank you, said Madame de Valla. Are you coming to my concert? No. They put us to bed, cried Freddy in disgust. Putting me to bed at 8.30 every night. What do you know about that? Just when the orchestra would be tuning up for the evening performance. What a shame. I'd like to have you see my act. I bet it's great. You got the looks, too. That's what it takes in this profession. Make a quick change? No, I wear the same dress all through. Oh, well, he sighed deeply. Well, it's been great to see you anyway. Goodbye. The great lady bent down to him and kissed his forehead. Goodbye, Freddy, she said. You've helped me so much. Freddy drew in a long breath. Hmm, he sighed. You know how I come to peek in your door like that? Because you heard me screaming, damn. No, before that. Coming all the way down the hall, I could smell it. it smelled so nice. Don't none of these ladies use perfume. I just knew somebody I'd like was in here soon as I got that smell. Oh, Freddy, I like you, too. But I've got to hurry now. Goodbye. And thanks so much, dear. She started out the door. Oh, gee, I can't go to bed, Freddy wailed. Come along, then, cried Madame Davala, impetuously seizing his hand. I'll make them let you go to the concert. They must. They ran down the hall together, hand in hand. Freddy directing the way to the Mrs. Blair's study. Miss Eva and Miss Nellie and Mary were there, and they looked at Freddy compassionately. And though Miss Eva said it was most unusual, Miss Nellie agreed to Madame de Valle's request. For, said gentle Miss Nellie, drawing Madame de Valle aside and lowering her voice, for we are very sorry for Freddy now. His mother... Oh, yes, she has gone to England. Why, no, she is dead. Oh, mio povero bambino, and how he adores her. Yes, and what will he do then? He can stay on here, but I am afraid he doesn't like us, Miss Nelly sighed. Has he no one else? No, that is a stepfather, but his mother put him here to save him from the stepfather's abuse, 
and all the coarsening influences of stage life, if you understand. Ah, oh, yes, I understand, said Madame Duvala. And yes, I think I understand the little one, too. He and I, we, we have the same nature. We cannot breathe in the too high altitudes. For us there must be dancing in the valley, laughter and roses, perfume and sunshine, always sunshine. Oh, uh, yes, replied Miss Nelly, taken aback by this effusiveness, which she could only explain as being foreign. It's 8.30, said Miss Eva, looking at her watch. Ah, then I must fly, cried Madame Davala. Goodbye, said Freddy wistfully. Au revoir, said Madame Duvala, and electrified the Mrs. Blair by adding, See you after the show, kid. I am very lonely, too, said Margarita Duvala after the concert. Lonely and sad. You are? Freddy cried in amazement. Then, practically, what about? It's about a man, confessed the lady. Aguan exclaimed Freddy incredulously. Say, lowering his voice confidentially, let me tell you something. They ain't a man on earth worth crying for. How did you know? asked Margarita. Flo Florette used to say so. And then a cloud passed over his face. She used to say so, he added. There was a moment's silence while the lady watched him. Then Freddy's mobile face cleared, his eyes shone with their old gay confidence. Say, I'm telling you, said Freddy, spreading his feet apart, thrusting his hands in his pockets, I ain't got no use for men at all. And you take my advice, don't bother over them. Margarita laughed. She laughed so hard that Freddy had joined her, and without knowing how, he was by her side holding on to her hand while they both rocked with merriment. When they could laugh no more, he snuggled up to the shoulder that smelled so nice. His face became babyish and wistful. He stroked the satin of the lovely gown with one timid finger, while his blue eyes implored hers. Ladies and children is nicest, ain't they? he appealed. Suddenly the great Margarita Duvala caught him in her arms and drew him to that warm, beautiful breast where no child's head had ever rested. Oh, Freddy, Freddy, she cried. You are right, and I must have you. You can. Slong's florets away, said Freddy. End of 52 Weeks for Florette.